Okay, so that brings me through the announcements. So I think we are ready to officially kick off with uh, CE Farm 2020. So I have the honor of introducing our first keynote speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Wolfgang Thorman. So Professor Thorman earned his PhD in 1981 from the University of Bern, Switzerland, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Arizona and as well at Deakin University in Australia. In 1985, he became an associate professor at the Center for Separation Science at the University of Arizona. In 1988, he moved to the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Bern, where he worked as a, a professor and the head of the analytical laboratory until his retirement in 2018. Till this day, he still continues to provide advice to projects of former collaborators and colleagues, Professor Thorman and his associates have worked on various aspects of capillary electrophoresis for more than 40 years, including its use as a diagnostic tool for the analysis of drugs, metabolites, and endogenous compounds in body fluids and tissues. Other activities that he's focused on um, included using dynamic computer simulation and experimental validation of analytical and preparative instruments, he is an author or co-author of more than 300 publications and scientific periodicals, and he is uh, a co-author of the dynamics of electrophoresis. So at this time, I would like to, to hand the ball over to Professor Thorman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for to the whole uh, organizing committee to uh, invite me for to give this presentation here. As you nicely mentioned, I'm working in that field for some uh, four decades already. And uh, I was more than 30 years working in uh, clinical diagnostics using capillary electrophoresis, mainly for drugs and also some endogenous compounds like transferrin. This came about because we were associated with hepatology, hepatology and clinical Pharmacology was in the same department, so the hepatologists were always interested in knowing whether a patient whose liver was failing is drinking any alcohol. This is easily done if he just drank before coming to see the physician, but if, if the, the patients are typically clever enough, so they don't do that. So they stop before, so you need a test for uh, drinking alcohol, which you can monitor changes in your body for a longer period of time. And this is transferrin. Transferrin, that's how we are starting to use this CE things. Transferrin is a glycoprotein. It has a single peptide change with 679 amino acids. It has two iron binding sites. It has two linked glycan chains bound at position 413 and 611. The molecular mass is about 80 kilodalton. And we have quite a bit of serum, of, uh, of transferrin in serum, namely two to four grams per liter, which amounts to about 4% of the total serum proteins. So the structure of the molecule is quite complex. How can we simplify that in this way? So we have the polypeptide bond, uh, chain here, and we have typically two, not all of the isoforms, but typically two glycans. And we have, at the end of the glycans, we might have some sialic acids. In this particular case, there are four sialic acids. And this is called, in this particular case, tetracyalotransferrin. According to the literature, there are eight different transferrin molecules in terms of, of uh, sialic acid. So these glycoforms uh, can vary between acyalotransferrin, where there's no sialic acid, and octasyalotransferrin. In a healthy person, you have about this distribution. So you don't detect this one, you don't detect these two ones, but you can detect the other ones here, mainly between disyalo and hexacyalotransferrin. These molecules have various iron loads in the body. So you can have either no iron at all, 
you can have one iron atom or you can have two iron atoms. Right. Thus, you have a multitude of different molecules and all these molecules uh, have to be reduced a little bit. So what you do is you add iron three before analysis such that you can reduce the number of possible molecules. The PI values of these molecules range between five and six in the iron saturated mode. What we measured or what we started the project with was to determine carbohydrate deficient transferrin, which is a marker of chronic alcohol abuse. If you drink a lot of alcohol, then your body is slowly changing the content of your uh, glycoproteins. The distribution of the, of the various glycoforms of a protein vary. So what, what it amounts to, the monocellular and the acellular transferrin are increased as well as the decellular transferrin, but not at all the other one. That means if you measure these three and you add them up, you have a value called carbohydrate deficient transferrin. I will come to that a little bit later once more to visualize it in, a, in an easy way. What you can also do with an CESA, you can measure genetic variants, you recognize the genetic variants, and you can measure congenital disorders of glycolization, always with, with a serum analysis. Here once more, the icons for the various molecules. This was the tetracellular transferrin we had before. Then we have trisialo transferrin, so only three sialic acids. Here we have only two, and this only on one. And I'm saying that on purpose because we will see other examples later on, on one glycon change. And the acialo transferrin, uh, typically in, in, uh, which is common in alcohol abusers, uh, has no carbohydrate chain at all. How do we do the C analysis of transferring glycoforms? Well, we know that the glycoforms differ in charge and mass. I already mentioned the iron saturation, which reduces number of molecules. We work in small ID fused silica capillary. We operate at an alkaline pH, about 8.5. That means for these type of molecules, they are negatively charged. We do have to use capillary wall conditioning because we directly inject diluted serum and we detect at 200 nanometers. In some cases, there is insufficient transferrin or there is an interference. For these cases, we have to use immuno extraction. What kind of C instruments can be used? Well, any C instrument can be used. Single C instruments like those from uh, Cyex or Agilent or other suppliers can be used with laboratory made or commercial reagents. Commercially, uh, I'm referring here to the uh, reagents produced by Analyse in Belgium, and they are called CEO Fix, and I will talk about those later on because we are using those. Then you can have multi capillary analyzers which, with reagent kits, which are walk away automated systems. One is from France, from uh, Sibia, it's called Capillaris. And the other one is from Helena Bioscience Europe, which is called V8CE system. Both of them operate with eight capillaries in parallel. So instead of measuring one at a time, you can measure eight samples simultaneously. Now let's briefly focus on the principle of dynamic double coating. As I already mentioned, we are injecting diluted serum. That means we have a heavy protein load and the proteins tend to stick or alter the surface of a few silica capillary. And we try to avoid that in order to have reproducible results. What we do here, we first introduce a polycation, wash the capillary with a polycation. Uh, typically of the type polybrine. What is in these C or fixed reagents, I don't know because they are proprietary, but it must be a molecule either polybrine or a very similar. So this is the first coating, this one here. Then you have your buffer, you introduce your buffer and the buffer contains a polyanine uh, like polyvinyl sulfonate. 
and you produce the second layer. Now you have again a negatively charged surface, so-called, such that you have a strong electrosmotic flow. Remember, we are working at pH 8.5, so the electrosmotic flow is strong towards the cathode. We introduce the sample on one side and we detect directly online on the other side of the cathode in a typical CE setup. In this particular configuration, the transferrin migration induced by the electric field is lower compared to the electrosmotic flow, such that all transferrin molecules are transported towards the cathode, that means across the point of detection. And acyalotransferrin with no sialic acid residues is detected first, and hexacyalotransferrin is detected last. Here's an example. And an example in, in uh, using the PACE MDQ of Beckman Coulter, uh, it, that's an uh, older slide, so it, it, the new instruments of Beckman are now sold by SIEX. Here we have the result. It's a 50 micrometer ID, 60 centimeter column. We condition first with sodium hydroxide and then with the polycatine solution and then with the polyanine trisporate buffer at pH 8.5. We apply we apply the sample volumetrically by uh, vacuum and then we separate at 20 kilovolts with a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. And we get the following results. We have here the uh, cations coming first, then the electrosmotic flow marker, and then the an anions. And the anions contain first the gamma fraction of the serum, followed by the transferrin pattern. How do we know that these are transferrins? Well, we can prove that by using immunosubtraction. We add, prior to analysis, a little bit of a monoclonal antibody to or a polyclonal antibody to subtract the uh, transferrin and then re-measure the supernatant and what we get is a clean electrophorogram in the area of transferrin. That's how we prove that these peaks are really transferring. The voltage remains constant during a run and the current as well. Now with this kind of setup we have a sample throughput of about 2.5 to 3. According to the suggestions of the manufacturer of the CDT reagents, they are using a higher voltage and have five samples per hour at the expense of a lower resolution. We didn't want to have this lower resolution, so we stick to the lower voltage at the expense of time. So we have a longer runtime. And we do that on purpose because we are analyzing a lot of samples from hepatology. That means that we have some nasty samples among them. Then very important for my last top topic then uh, of today uh, is the, uh, the sample size. Here we use typically 60 microliter of serum and 60 microliter of the iron-3 solution, which are combined and then directly injected. This it might be too high when you use from uh, uh, with blood from infants. So you need you need to uh, have the other vials and Cyx is offering nano vials, which we can use for five microliter serum and five microliter uh, iron three solution and get the very same result. Here are two examples, namely the example of a healthy individual with a CDT level of 1.06%. What does that mean? That means we are measuring the peak areas with valley to valley peak integration, and we are expressing the data as area percent in relation to the sum of all transferring peaks. So we know that these are all transferring peaks. We measure the area, we sum it up, and we see how much uh, of the total is the peak of these yellow transferring. Here in this particular case, this is a healthy person. We don't see any ACL of transferrin. So the, the DCL of transferrin 1.06 is the CTT value. And the major compound here is the tetracyl transferrin, which amounts to about 78% in this particular case. Now, if you 
analyze a serum of an alcohol abuser, then you realize you get a different picture. And the different picture is that suddenly the DC allotransferrin peak is larger, and you can also have a AC allotransferrin peak. In this particular case, this is the AC allo result, and this is the DC allo result, and the sum of the two is 4.56%. No monosialotransferin, which would be here, has been detected. Monosialotransferin is very rarely seen in alcohol abuse. The, the, the peaks here have to be really high, then this starts to evolve as well. The ref reference value for CDT is 1.7%. So everything below 1.7% is normal. Everything above 1.7% is elevated and is an indication for alcohol abuse. Here quickly some data for the precision for the two for the very two samples here from the same publication taken, which is listed down here. It's an old one. Uh, the detection time reproducibility is very good. It's less than one percent RSD, and the amount is of of uh, of of a peak from that is DCR lot, three CR lot, tetra cell, etc. Uh, transferring is quite good as well. The, the smaller the peak, the larger is the RSD value. And the same is true for here. So for here again, less than 1% for detection time and for peak areas in the order of three or depending on the size of three to uh, four, maybe sometimes 5%. And this is, this is quite important. We have to measure the small peaks in order to get the result we want to have. It's, it's not a matter of measuring the tetraciolo transfer in here. And furthermore, we need to have a good resolution between, between the DCLO and the trisialo transfer in. And this is very well done, uh, very well achieved with our high resolution method. Here we have an, an interesting example just to visualize to you how this works in practice and how can we, uh, we can. Uh, monitor a patient. Here we have the result of a patient at day 10 of a set of data and then day 31 in between three weeks of vacation of this patient. The patient came back and suddenly his pattern looked kind of completely different. It went from a normal pattern to an alcohol abuser pattern. And he was confronted with the data just from one or two days uh, measured in around day 31. And he said, well, I haven't taken any alcohol. So he was, he was followed for uh, quite a long time, na namely 19 weeks. And here are the data. Blue is CDT. Red is AC allotransferrin. Black is DC allotransferrin. And you can see before vacation, the values were normal. This is 1.7% for uh, CDT. And after vacation, we had a pretty nice ACLO peak, and we had a much elevated, almost 9% of DCLO transferring, a very high CDT value. And then the CDT value slowly came down week by week, by week by week, until it reached normal level again. And you see what the, this takes quite some time. So the apparent half lives for the ACLO transferring is about five days. And for the uh, DC allot transferrin, it's in the order of a week. So it takes a while on this comes this comes down. So you have a marker for alcohol uh, abuse, even if the patient stopped drinking a few days or a week before he comes to see the physician and his blood taken. Then, then we can still see when he's a heavy drinker, we can still monitor an extended level. Now, what happened? Well. He was obviously drinking alcohol in, during his vacation. And when we confronted him uh, with the whole kinetics here over, over this the whole thing, he admitted it, that he was indeed drinking a lot of alcohol while he was on vacation. This is just an overview of showing the, uh, for CDT values measured during a 10 year period with about 6,500 samples. 83% of these samples were normal, 16% were above the threshold value, 
which uh, means that uh, these are all alcohol abusers. And only in four, uh, 414 samples, the ACLO transferrin could be measured. Please note that this is on a log scale and this is on a normal scale. Just to see the decay here, it was nicer to present it on a log scale. When we now plot data as uh, uh, in the order of increasing TCLO transferrin values, you can see down here, there's no ACLO transferrin measured at all until we reach the threshold value. Still a little bit after the threshold value, there's no ACLO transferrin measured either. And then starts uh, slowly, it evolves and starts to uh, form a, a detectable peak, uh, which then is increasing a lot at these very high values from here. Remember, the upper reference value is 1.7%. When we do that in a clinical laboratory, we have to have quality control. This is essential, otherwise we are not allowed to measure uh, clinical samples and we are not allowed to charge the patients for the, for the analytical work. So what we do, we, we did two things. We measured a serum of a healthy person over a very long time. This is now again, the data shown for 10 years, always the serum of the very same person from our lab. And we have a few changes along the way. Here we have a uh, essay change. Here we have a, uh, a lot change. Essay change means analysis was changing the composition of the, of the reactions. It didn't have a big infect, in, uh, impact on our result. But the lot change after a long time, these samples were frozen in aliquots, which are very stable in uh, frozen conditions, uh, the lot change then was a bit, provided a bit higher. And here we had an instrument change. Again, the instrument change didn't, didn't uh, provide any, any much difference. And the overall mean of all this was, was uh, 1.02%. We also have commercial controls that were produced by uh, commercial uh, companies for HPLC analysis. One is called Recipe, that's a German product, and the other one is from Biorad. They differ a little bit. The Recipe one has an ACLO peak and a DCLO peak. The Biorad has only an elevated DCLO peak. But both of them can be used to measure or to control the measuring of DCLO transfer. And here are some typical interday precision data. It's taken from the sixth year here, uh, from the routine lab, the uh, human serum, the RSD value for these uh, five uh, sets uh, after each other uh, was four, around 4%. Here we were about around 6%, and here we were around 5%. The interesting fact, when you use these commercial controls, we realized that these deteriorated with time. So we could only, the pattern changed a little bit and we could only use them for a certain amount of time. And then we had to take a new one. On top of everything, we are obliged, if possible, to external quality control. And we subscribe to a proficiency test scheme in Germany for uh, forensic analysis, uh, the markers of alcoholism in serum. And here's a result of such a serum. We have, our result was 3.73%. It's positive, obviously, it's above 1.7. You see that the DC transferrin is quite large and there's a small AC transferrin too. When we uh, reported this result to the, the, the organizers of the scheme, they returned, uh, they told us how good we were. And essentially, they compared it with other CE users, similar type as we did. This were 10 labs at the time. The average, the mean was 3.84. We were on 3.73. That's a good, good match. The same with the HPLC analysis. You see HPLC, these were 26 labs uh, reported at that time. And the result here was 3.7. A little bit different is the CBISA. The CBISA worked on a lower resolution and therefore the uh, the value is lower 
And here we compare just the data of 46 different external quality control samples, our data versus the mean of the CZE data, or our data versus the mean of the HPLC data. And you can see that we have almost a line of equality. Here, the bias is a little bit larger compared to the comparison to the HPLC data, which is almost zero here in the bias. And the line of equality is almost perfect. We are confident, or we were confident, that we can use this. And we already used this assay uh, since 18 years now in routine. Before my retirement two years ago, we, uh, we transferred the assay to the clinical chemistry lab at the University Hospital in Bern. And my lab technicians also went to work there. And so they continue to use the same assay and I occasionally interact with them with data interpretation and things like that. What happens if we cannot measure a result? That's an example right here. This is a patient serum from the hepatology unit, uh, which is, has a very low amount of transfer. And we couldn't see a Tisialo peak. We saw the Trisialo, Tetrasialo, and Pentasialo, and possibly the Hexasialo here. Uh, so we had to concentrate the sample in order to be able to measure as a thing six. Now, the problem is in these hepatology patients, you see there's a hill here. It goes up a little bit. And there are the gamma globulins, which extend in here. Some of the gamma globulins are also here. So the amount of these gamma globulins here is too large and mask as well. So what you have to do, you have to extract it. And we developed the number of immuno extraction uh, procedures, how to do it. This was with a commercial IGY transferrin purification column. And as a result, what we found, very interesting, this was done in collaboration with Annalise in Belgium. Uh, we found that the pattern is now nicely detectable. And we even in this particular case, we had also an ACL transferrin peak and a DCL transferrin, which we don't see here. So this is quite nice and this can be evaluated and you see it's a positive sample. It has a CDT value of 14.12%. Here's another example. Uh, unfortunately, these columns were very expensive at the time. I don't know how the price is are uh, today, but at the time they were very, very expensive. So we started to, to make our own anti-transferring column, spin column. And uh, so that was, uh, that was a project which we, which we pushed the data in 2012. Uh, here is an interesting, uh, again, hepatology patient sample with a nasty interaction there. You don't know what it is. It is not transferring because when we apply it to this column and run analyze the flow through fraction you have it right here and there are some other interferences as well and here as well they're all removed and after preparation of the sample the release from the column and changing the buffer and concentrating it you have this nice pattern which we can be very nicely measured and evaluate it again. In this case, it's a positive sample. And obviously, not all of them are positive, but I'm showing that to do uh, better view uh, the pattern. These procedures are quite time consuming, and you can it can be at least four or five hours before you have this preparation accomplished, which is not practical for UT news at all. So we also evaluated immunosubtraction of transfer. Here you have the immunosubtraction data for the very same sample. And here the same sample analyzed in the same dilution. Immunosubtraction means that you add a reagent such that it, the whole system gets diluted. It's a 2.25 fold dilution. And then you electronically uh, subtract the two, this from this. And what you get is a pattern which is cleaner than the original sample, but not completely clean at all. So we did not use that on a routine basis. You can do it, but it, it's difficult and it's, it's, it is uh, much quicker than using a immuno extraction. 
but it is certainly not the way to go because it doesn't provide very clean electrophilograms. So these two things are just to tell you that there might be problems if there are interferences or low amounts of transfer. Now, what else can we measure with this assay? We can measure genetic variants. Up to now, I showed you always a nice pattern, namely a pattern with, if it's an alcohol abuser, with an ACLR transferrin peak, then a DCLR, GCLR, etc. Now, what happens if you have a genetic variant? What, what is a genetic variant? That means it has a substitution of one or several amino acids in the peptide chain. And what the, you, what the result is, you have a composite of two glycoform patterns. Two such patterns in one. Luckily enough, the substitution of the amino acids changes the PI values of the two variants, such that we can get two, a composite of two glycoform patterns. And this is now here a so-called transferring CD variant with the PI value of the D form being larger than the D PI value of the C form. So we have a shift of the, of a, the second pattern to the left. But that means that we first measure ACL or transferring of the D variant and then the C variant and then TCL transferrin, and then TCL transferrin of the D variant, and then here we have the TCL transferrin of the C variant, etc. Sometimes we have overlap, like this in this case here, and sometimes we have partial, partial separation, like here. So we have two patterns. And how do we determine CTT now in this pattern? Well, in principle, you should measure this peak, this peak, this peak, and this peak here. And related the sum of these four peaks related to the total transfer in node. This peak is not fully resolved. So to make life easier and to provide a good estimate, you take just one AC allo and this DC allo peak and add it up and multiply by two. In a sum with the assumption that you are having a one-to-one -one distribution. And this is mostly the case. I'm unaware of any clear patterns which do not have a one-to-one -one distribution. But what we can have, we can have different genetic variants of transferring. I showed you this example before, the transferring CD. There can also be a transferring BC that the PI value of the C now is larger than the PI value of the B. So we have a shift of the whole pattern to the right, to longer detection times. Here we had shorter detection time for the D variant, and here we have a longer detection time for the B variant. And obviously you can also have a combination of B and D, which is, which is right here. And this means that we have a, a no C in this particular case. That these are all transferring is again proven by the fact that the immune subtraction data show no peak in this area. So that means that transferring has really, these are all transferring peaks in this particular case. So you have to be very careful. And this is again very important because we do have high resolution here, so as such that we can easily recognize these patterns. We can even recognize a CC variant where the PI difference is very, very, very small. So you see a double peak here, you see a double peak here, and you see a double peak here. All the low resolution methods don't realize that. Even low resolution methods might have problem to resolve anything like that. And they might have problem to resolve this, and such that you cannot evaluate the data yet. So you need to have high resolution. And this CE approach is quite interesting. And remember, we have a very simple sample prep. We take just an aliquot of serum as well as an aliquot of, uh, of iron-3 solution, mix them, 
and inject the picture. Now, in order to prove that we indeed have a genetic variant, what else can you do? You can remove the sialic acid residues here by neuraminidase prior to analysis. And what you convert to is this complex picture, which is shown now for a transferrin BC variant to two major peaks, the aceola transferrin of C and the aceola transferrin of B. And what you actually do, if it's complete, you essentially transfer this kind of molecule with the four sialic acid residues into an aceola transferrin molecule where the, uh, uh, the sialic acid residues are cleaved off. Cleaved off, sorry. That this is transferrin is again proven by the immunal subtraction data as well as here. And you can see now the difference when you have a, not a genetic variant, just one peak for, for uh, the transfer in C. Then you can see this has, this is not a genetic variant, but this is a genetic variant. The peak with the asterisk are small amounts of monocellular transferring, which are uh, not completely uh, DCL related. And here are now the patterns you are expecting. This is the uh, not the genetic variant. This is the typical uh, pattern for of the desialization for the uh, uh, transfer in C. And then we have uh, CD variant, uh, BD variant, and the B BC variant. Two peaks, two peaks, major two peaks, two peaks, and one peak. So this is a, also a way how you can do it. The next one is congenital disorders of glycolization. And now it becomes a bit more difficult. Type one, there are two major types. Type one refers to defects in the assembly of transfer of the oligosaccharide change, chain, resulting in the lack of complete N-glycans. We call it also hypoglycosylation. The type two are defects in the trimming and processing of the protein bound glycans resulting in immature truncated glycans, which is called under cellulation. Here's an example. And the example is for the type one disorder. The type one disorder means in this particular case, it's a PMMM2, which means phosphomonose mutase deficiency. That's an enzyme, which has an impact on the pattern. Here we have the control pattern with ACL or transferrin, DCL or 3, etc. And here we have the patient pattern. And the patient pattern now looks very different. The patient pattern now shows you a tetrasialo transferrin peak, which is about has about the same magnitude as the tisialo transferrin. We have a little bit of monosialo, we have a little bit of trisialo, but less than usual, and we have a strong peak for asialo transferrin. That means the lack of complete N glycons. This peak has no N glycons anymore, and you see all these peaks are again they are uh, transferrin. They are uh, proven by the fact that we show here the, uh, sub, uh, the uh, immunosubstraction data. You can now combine this patient serum, which is shown here again, with the serum of an alcohol abuser. And you realize uh, the mixture, the analysis of the mixture provides the transferrin peak here and the transferrin peak. Tisialo here, also together, then trisialo, tetrasialo, pentasialo, and hexasialo. And this, just to remind you, is a, is a normal, is a normal uh, pattern. So the conclusion here is, and this is, this is the interesting fact, with a type 1 deficiency, you get a completely different pattern. You can recognize it right away because this is not the pattern of an alcohol uh, abusing person. 
but the glycoforms are the same as in healthy in a healthy person or in the alcohol. So there's no difference in the glycoforms. And these are again the glycoforms I showed you at the beginning with the AC yellow having no N glycans, the DC yellow peak having just one N glycan and etc. Et now how does it look? with the congenital disorders type 2. The congenital disorders type 2 or NG, this is an example 2A, MGAT2 has a completely different pit pattern. Typically only two peaks, that's it. They are again transferring, you see. And if you look carefully at these things, this, this yellow transferring marked here with two and an asterisk, is migrating a little or detected a little bit ahead of the regular DC allo transferrin peak. And here we have the tri allo transferrin, the tetra allo, etc. Not, 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 no major other peaks here. And here are the isoelectric focusing data for the very same sample where the DC allo peak is the major peak. And then we have a little bit of tri allo and we have a little bit of, of mono allo. Monosiala must be right here somewhere, but we don't see it. It's too too faint. These data were used um, produced on uh, immobiline gel uh, isoelectric focusing uh, system. Here we have another patient, and this is a patient now a so-called COG5 disease, the CDG2I, and it produces a pattern like this. We have again a DC yellow peak, but interestingly enough, the DC yellow peak is also detected ahead of a normal DC yellow. So you see the resolution between uh, the peak two marked with an asterisk is, is uh, further apart from DC yellow as it appeared in the control sample. Again, the immunosubstraction data are, uh, are uh, producing a nice uh, curve, so we know that this is all transferring. But now we have to combine these samples in order to, to show whether these this yellow, the normal this yellow transferring and the this yellow transferring marked with an acidic are separable or not. So here's again the data of, uh, of the MGAT2 patient and the data of an alcohol abuser, and here is the mixture of the two. And you see, the, uh, the, there is a, a, a unresolved double peak here. So you have the, the, the two and the two star or two asterisks here are incompletely separate, but they are quite detected. If you have now the other type two patient serum and combine it with the alcohol abuser, you have two separate peaks, two asterisks and two. Here the amount is too high. That's the reason the separation was not complete. And when you analyze a mixture of these two samples, you realize that the DC allo transferring peak of the two uh, patient samples, they are migrating together. So what's the conclusion here? And this is quite interesting. The conclusion is that these CDG type 2 patterns have undercellulated DC allo transferring glycoforms of the form which are drawn here. They have both N glycans. The normal has only one N glycan and therefore has a lower molecular mass. And it appears that we can separate these two compounds. Now, when you look at by, uh, with other means, we cannot do that by CE, but from the uh, LCMS literature, where they analyze such CDG samples, uh, they tell us that the MGA2 disease produces two different DC allo transferrins, both with both, uh, with both N-glycons, but differing a little bit here, as you can see. Now, the question is, can we separate these two? No, we can't. 
the resolution of the CSA is sufficient. So we measure these two together in, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, capital electrophoresis here. Now we are already coming to the uh, next sample. And this is a quite a challenging and interesting sample as well. It's, all, it's a mixed type one on two congenital disorder. And in this kind of samples, you measure common hypoglycosylated and undercellulated glycoforms. In this particular case, we have a PGM1 CDD that is, uh, has a lack or a deficiency in phosphoglucomutase activity. When you measure this pattern, you get many peaks in this area between the regular disyalo and the regular acyalo peak, you get a number of peaks, and you get even a peak ahead of the regular acyalo peak. And in this particular case, it's not a genetic variant because we don't have, we only have one major peak here. So you know that right away that this must be something else. When you look at this very carefully, here are the gel data again for isoelectric focusing analysis. And when you look at this, the controls here, you realize that we have a number of peaks. You can assign the first peak as a zero asterisk, then zero, and then that means acyalotransferrin, then one asterisk and one are both uh, monocyalotransferrin, but different ones, and then two asterisk and two are the two uh, disyalotransferrin, and then three, four, and five, and six are normal. How can we prove that a little bit? Well, we mixed the PGMM1 sample with that of an alcohol abuser and reanalyze the mixture and you realize now that the, the uh, one peak is becoming strong. Sorry, that's the mixture up here. That's the alcohol abuser, uh, alcohol abuser itself analyzed. And here is the mixture. So we have uh, an elevated uh, ACLO peak from the alcohol abuser which comes here. So we here the magnitudes of the two peaks were in the same order of magnitude, but here not anymore, etc. Now again, looking at LCMS data to measure or to see what's going on here. We have the uh, acyalotransferrin from the regular one is this one. Then here's the monocyalo and here's the disyalo, which are the peaks two, one, and zero. And here are representative structures for an acyalo transferring peak in this particular case uh, with one glycan left. Here, one uh, for monocyalo transferring with two glycans. And again, two glycans here for the disyalo transferring. So we now are now confident that we can distinguish between these forms by a regular CE method, the very same method as we are using to measure uh, CDT in human serum. Now I have two more slides here. I'm only showing this very quickly. Time is almost over. Uh, when you have a patient sample with a very high transferring peak, you get an extra peak in front of this yellow. And we have shown that this peak is of the structure again with the two N glycans. We don't know why it's, this is formed in the body that way. And as far as I know, nobody has uh, made any in-depth study to analyze this kind of compounds so far. But we just discovered that by uh, our, our uh, routine analysis work that we get this extra peak. And this is come, uh, always the same, always there when we have much higher tricyalotransferrin levels. Here, the normal value for tricyalotransferrin is three to seven. In this particular case, it's 18%. That's quite high, sky high actually. Here, 11%, and this has very low. And when we have a very low value, there's nothing. A normal or very low value, we don't have this extra peak. But again, it's un undercellulated this yellow transferrin, which is being formed and detected by the CESA. And last, 
is the example of cerebrospinal fluid, which uh, is CSF. CSF in CSF there is a, bet, a so-called beta two transferrin, which can be, from the clinical point of view, measured in nasal fluid, which marks as CSF leakage in after accidents of skull accidents and things like that. Or it has also been suggested to be used as test for neurogenerative diseases. When we measure CSF on its own, injecting like serum, we don't see a peak at all. We have to concentrate, concentrate it with ultrafiltration, 150 fold, then we get a nice picture. And we get a nice picture with an impurity here. We don't know where this impurity comes from, but it's clear from the immunosubstraction data that this is not TCLO transferring. That's the reason I put them a question mark here. But in, of interest is the fact that we have peaks here, here a double peak and here a double peak. And this first peak of the first double peak was found to co-migrate with neuraminidase treated serum, the ACLO transferrin of neuraminidase treated serum of this structure here. And uh, so you can, again, mixture it with, with, uh, with uh, alcohol abuser, and then you can see that the alcohol abuse produces its, its acyalo transferrin uh, in front, in, in between the, uh, the monocyalo transferrin from the CSF and the acyalo transferrin from the CSF. But the acyalo transferrin is not the same as in the, in the alcohol abuse. So these are the conclusions here. There's not much work being done in that area yet, but I, I am sure that this will come up soon. We published these data very recently uh, this year, at the beginning of this year actually, and I'm sure it will, uh, uh, these kind of analysis will be continued later on. To sum up, uh, clinical diagnostics of transferring glycophols by high resolution CE, provides an interesting mean to measure CDT in human serum, genetic variants, congenital disorders of glycolization, as well as in human serum, and transferrin in uh, cerebrospinal fluid. The pros are very little sample preparation, small amounts of sample, automation, precision is good, high resolution, high throughput if you have multiple capillaries, and you realize abnormal transferrin patterns. The bad side might be unselective detection in, of, with the occasional interferences. If you have insufficient transferrin, you have to concentrate your transferrin by immuno extraction. And in very rarely, you see insufficient resolution for selected patient zero. I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm a little bit over time, I guess. Here are all the people who were working in that project in the past 20 years. Uh, and we were mainly funded by Swiss National Science Foundation and the Liver Foundation in Bern, as well as we got reagent kits for free to promote and, and analyze that stuff uh, by analysts in Surly in Belgium. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Thorman, for an excellent talk. Um, we've had people submitting questions uh, throughout the course of your talk, so we will uh, go through some of those real quick. I want to remind all attendees that, you know, we are still accepting questions. So, you know, if anything comes up uh, based on, on an answer from Professor Thorman, you know, please feel free to ask additional questions. Okay, I'm going to start at the top. Okay, what is the mechanism by which chronic alcohol intake removes the carbohydrates from transferrin? Well, this is a very good question, and I believe nobody knows the exact answer. I, at, at least me, I don't know it. And, and uh, the literature is not clear on it either. So you cannot Google it and get the answer. And, uh, and the... Uh, the specialists, the biochemists who are looking into these matters, they are speculating, uh, but they are not sure what it is. Okay. 
So sorry, I cannot give right. you a straight answer. And I'm not a biochemist myself. I'm an analytical chemist. So some of my partners <laughs> might, would have known maybe a bit uh, more in depth answer, but no, there is no clear cut answer. It's this or that. Okay, thank you. It must be very complex. Okay, and it's also a very <laughs> slow process. Yeah. Okay, our next question is around the dynamic coding and comparing the patterns from patient over time. So how reproducible is the migration time for the different silated forms? Do you use a migration marker? We don't use a migration marker, but the reproducibility is below 1%. When you measure it, uh, say, 10 times your sample or five times your sample, then it's below 1%. But it might, if, if the temperature is not set correctly, it might vary from, from, uh, from, from months to months or something like that. Once we had suddenly longer detection times and we didn't know why. So there was uh, the, the thermostat was, not, was broken at the instrument. So the temperature of the running was not the same. But it's, it's, it's incredible, it's incredible still. We couldn't believe that, and we measured many, many samples, and we published it as well. Uh, it's incredible how how uh, how stable it is. At the beginning, I didn't say that, but I didn't. We didn't use double coating. We used single coating at the beginning, or or laboratory made coatings, and uh, like the people in in Italy, from uh, Verona, and uh, and this. The reproducibility at that time, that time was not as great, but starting to use the double coating really did the job. That's the reason Analyz was so successful in promoting this technology here in Europe. I don't know how, how whether it's used in the US. The reagents can be bought by Analyz in Belgium or can be bought through Cyex, formerly Beckman. Mm -hmm. So another question about the double coating reagents, what is the safe pH one could use for the separation buffer without degrading the coating during the run? Is the coating, dynamic coating applied prior to every injection? Yes, we do renew the coating every time. So I know that people say that double coatings can be used 10 times, 15 times, but we never did that. We always so-called renew it from before each analysis which means that we might not have a pure double coating we might have multiple layers multiple double layers on top of each other in principle we don't know that okay, okay so incredible precision for the control samples so why isn't CE being used more for clinical analysis? That, Where and how have we been missing out? CE is quite a bit used for CDT analysis here in Europe, but probably not as much in the US, United States. CBR promoted this technology, her, their technology, uh, very strongly in the past 15 years. And at least in Switzerland, almost every lab is not is doing using CE and not uh, not HPLC. Other labs, other other labs use HPLC, and some labs use uh, immunoassays. Now the immunoassays were very poor for many many years. They have now a monoclonal antibody assay, which is better, but still you cannot recognize everything, or not as nice as with a separation method. So in principle, the uh, Scandinavian people or so, they are using HPLC. Most of them are using HPLC. And HPLC is doing the job as well, but it's more laborious, more sample prep, et cetera. CE is less known in clinical labs uh, in terms of uh, pharmacology labs. They are more known in, uh, in, um, in clinical labs who do serum analysis work. And again, this is quite common here in, in, in uh, Europe that the serum analysis are done by CE. I don't know how it's in the US today. It used to be a, 
uh, acetate ce cellulose electrophoresis 30 years ago or so, but now it might also be CE. Okay, thank you. So we have a question around specificity. Do you clean up or purify your samples prior to injection, given that the serum will contain hundreds of proteins? If so, can you elaborate on what your sample cleanup step is? We don't use any cleanup uh, in a normal run. We just mix the serum with the iron-3 solution, equal volumes, and inject the mixture. No cleanup whatsoever. We realize that uh, you can realize that the gamma globulins are coming out first, followed by the transferrin. Everything else is not being is not being analyzed at all. We stop thereafter, and we have to use cleanup for samples which the transferrin is too low, and for samples which show an interference in the transferrin region when the pattern is weird then we, we, we have to further look into that. But the, the number of samples we had to use immuno extraction is not very large. It's mu much, much less than a percent of all the samples which were analyzed. And we had not normal samples. We had maybe 70 or 80 percent of our samples came from the hepatology unit. And these are people who are severely sick um, have no a, a liver which doesn't function well anymore, like a cirrhotic liver or something like that, and uh, and so we were really fortunate that we could use this assay for real measurements, and not just for the uh, uh, of of sick people, and not just the, the uh, serum of a uh, healthy individual. Okay. Uh, so a question around valley to valley integration. So was this done automated uh, to make data management possible? And when you see the genetic variances, you know, could this be automated then or does it have to be manual? With uh, genetic, with genetic thing has to be manual because, because there's, there are more twice amount of peaks. And you don't know when you make when you analyze the sample whether the, whether you have a genetic variant or not. You will find out uh, after looking at the data. Then you have to do it manually. But typically, it's done automatically. And uh, and uh, but we have to check whether the uh, integration was properly done or not for every serum. There has to be a human interaction here. Okay, I guess in order to keep us on time, I'm going to do one more question. Uh, do these CE-based methods remain as the current standard approach for diagnosing these specific transfer and conditions, or have some of them been replaced with newer tests, such as biomarker analysis? Uh, what are you referring to? Are you referring to the CDT, or are you referring to, for instance, genetic variants or so? Is, I think it, it, yeah, the question could really be for both. Well, for, for, uh, I, I don't think that you, for, uh, for, you can compare this with HPLC. Some people swear that H, that's their advantage of using HPLC, they're using HPLC or LCMS, obviously. LCMS, but this is more laboratories and cannot, cannot, uh, used for a clinical laboratory for screening purposes. You know, you, it might be used as a second step for a confirmation analysis, but not for a direct for a, for a, for a, for a screening. And if you have hundreds of samples, we should have a data fast and uh, cheap, in a, uh, inexpensively. Then you have to uh, do uh, cannot use LCMS. LCMS analytical work is much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of the first keynote session. Uh, so for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll have uh, virtual networking. Uh, we'd like to have everybody back by 925. We will start the uh, vaccine session at that time. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.